Steve Long has been inventing and innovating in plant biology for a long career that has had more than 250 peer-reviewed articles. He's been leading industry and university collaboration throughout the, the, the decade here at University of Illinois. I'd say he's been one of our stars that's been doing that. But some of his most recent research and work has gotten national attention, international attention, and funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I think it's fitting as we sit and eat lunch together that we talk about how we can use the technology that he and his research lab have um, been pioneering to use the sun's energy to increase plant productivity and have better food um, optimization to feed the planet and how that's being recognized as such an important goal to feed, feed a, a growing population and these types of uh, miraculous science that might be able to make that possible. I also thought it was important to point out that some of this research already has industry collaboration in addition to the foundation interest. Our friends at Syngenta that we pointed out this morning were early in striking an intellectual property agreement with our Office of Technology Management, which would allow them to see the opportunity to commercialize this into action. So we thank them for that. And I'll use that as a reminder also, we will be doing a ribbon cutting of the new Syngenta facility at 3.30, a sort of a groundbreaking um, intro to that facility. So please join us across the street for that. But let me get back to Steve Long and just say thank you for Steve being here and giving us a chance to learn more about your research. Thank you for bringing notoriety to Illinois and hopefully feeding the population. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Laura, for that generous introduction. So, um, as I've put in this title, I want to tell you primarily about our work in photosynthesis, which Illinois has been a world leader in for more than 50 years, and how we're applying that in trying to improve the productivity of both food and energy crops. So this first slide um, is important to me because it shows the Institute of Genomic Biology, so a state-of-the-art facility for looking at uh, genomics, so taking advantage of the high-throughput sequencing and analysis of material that we can do today. But in front of that are the Morrow plots, the oldest experiment on crop sustainability outside of Europe in the world. Um, and I think that shows a very important distinction of Illinois from many of the institutions pursuing genomics, that we have this connection with, with crops. And indeed, one of the attractions for me, one of the attractions of coming to the University of Illinois was the fact that we have this state-of-the-art experimental farm right next to campus. And it's, I can tell you, it's very hard to find that anywhere else in the world. And on top of that, we also have the National Super Center for Supercomputer Applications, so the largest public domain computer in the world. And all three of those have been very important to the research I'm going to tell you about. Now, uh, 380 if you're lucky for corn today. Um, you might not feel there's any food shortage. But if we project forward for our major crops, we look at how they've been improved over the, the last six or so decades. And we project forward and we say, well, we should be able to continue doing this. Then by 2050, we'll be here. But if you look at the analysis from the University of Minnesota, from Dave Tillman's group, the analysis from the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, they say that by 2050, we need to be here, not here. This is because not only if, is population, global population increasing, but global population is becoming more urban. By 2050, it's forecast that the global population will be more than 70% urban. Urban diets require more food because they tend to use more dairy products, more meat products, 
but there is also all the waste involved in distribution, sale, etc. And so, if we carry on improving our crops as we are now, by 2050, there'd be about a 30% shortfall. Now, that may not have too much impact on us. It'll mean prices go up, but the amount of household budget on food in the United States and the EU is not that great. However, in other countries in the world, 80% of the household budget goes on food. And this is a catastrophe, which is why perhaps the Department of Defense is more concerned about the, this than the USDA. However, if we look in more detail at what's going on, rice is the single most important direct source of human calories in the world. The three largest producers are China, India, and Indonesia. In the 70s and 80s, they were able to in increase productivity per hectare of land or per acre of land by about 30% per decade. In the first decade of this century, that number has dropped to about 5%. And this is despite the fact that, say, a country like China is investing more than 100 times what it was in the 70s and 80s into improvement of rice. So these yield gains are getting harder and harder to come by. Now, why might that be? Um, if we look at what underlies the yield of a crop growing under optimum conditions, it's basically the ability of that crop to capture the available solar energy through the growing season, then the ability, the ability it has to convert that captured radiation energy into the biomass of the crop. And finally, how much of that biomass ends up in the part we care about? So the grain of rice, the seed of soybean, and so on. And it's that last one which was greatly improved during the Green Revolution. So for an average of about 30% in our major crops to an average approaching 60%. Unfortunately, though, there's not much headroom left there which is one of the reasons why we're beginning to find it much harder to get yield increases today. If we look at interception efficiency, a soybean crop growing on the south farms can intercept as much as 90% of the solar radiation coming in during the growing season. So again, we can't do a great deal better than that. What is, though, different is conversion efficiency the process of photosynthesis. We know in theory that that should be about 10% or 0.1 as an efficiency. But for our very best crops, it's round about 0.03. So there is a big gap there, and that appears to be the one remaining opportunity we have with our major crops. If we look at crop ancestors, actually their, their efficiency is not very different from our best elite lines today. So it's something that conventional breeding has really failed to improve. And indeed, it's been very difficult until quite recently to actually gain funding to try and do this because one of the big arguments has been, well, if there's a free lunch on the table, evolution would have grabbed it. But we think there are good reasons why evolution hasn't necessarily grabbed it. One is that Survival in the wild depends on getting your genes into the next generation. And some of you may be familiar with the plant Arabidopsis. It's about this size. It's one of the most unproductive plants you can find. Yet in Eurasia, it's highly successful. It produces small seeds that spread all over the place. Another big change is that the ancestors of our crops grew in a carbon dioxide concentration of about 220 parts per million. Today, the concentration is 400 parts per million. And much of that increase has actually occurred over the last 50 years. Carbon dioxide is a limiting substrate for photosynthesis. So we've rapidly changed the concentration of this substrate, and evolution has not had time to keep up with that. And finally, oops.
Finally, if we look at ancestors of our modern crops, for example, here in the um, upper left corner, this is Eagleops cylindrica, one of the three ancestors of modern wheat. What you can see there is it's relatively open. There are relatively few leaves. Today we grow wheat like this, where we've got many layers of leaves. So we're really converting a plant which evolved in a sun situation into a plant where most of the leaves are now in a shade situation. A lot of our research shows that these crops are not well adapted to that situation. Another clue we have comes from unique experiments that were conducted just a mile from here down the road um, on the farm again with the soy face facility where we've been growing corn, soy and some other crops under completely open air conditions in the carbon dioxide concentration we expect for about the year 2060. So what we're doing in these experiments is boosting photosynthesis because CO2 is a limiting substrate. If we do that, do we get more yield? And the answer is yes, with soybean, rice, and wheat, many other C3 crops we've looked at, we boost photosynthesis, we get more yield. So there's another clue that if we could manipulate photosynthesis in some way, we would have more yield. Well, one of the things the supercomputer at Illinois has allowed us to do is to look at photosynthesis in a holistic way. If we're going to improve photosynthesis, there are 200 steps, all of which can vary quantitatively. So you have billions of possible permutations. How experimentally, you couldn't possibly work through those. But what we're able to do with the supercomputer is simulate the whole process on the supercomputer and then apply optimization algorithms to it to say, well, where are the bottlenecks? Where should we be focusing our effort? Now, of course, in a, in a crop, the leaves are in very different conditions, and that varies through the growing season. So what you can see here is a, a simulation rendered by the National Center for Sucom Computer Applications, which really accurately defines the lighting environment in a crop as it develops. Then we can put our biochemical model in there and to say, well, how do we optimize this situation? And when I first came to Illinois, we, we made use of this, and we made several predictions from theory as to how we could attack this problem and get more photosynthesis into crops. And we were quite lucky in that the Gates Foundation started to read what we were writing and after about a one-year series of discussions, then came to me and said, well, how about we put our money where your mouth is and you show us this can really be done. And so um, I was lucky to be able to assemble a team to go where uh, no person has gone before and um, just point out some of the characters. This is Martin Parry from Rothamsted in England, Don Ort, who heads the... USDA ARS unit on campus, Murray Badger from the Australian National University, and Christine Rains from the University of Essex um, in England. And between us, we've been leading this 25 million investment. Our strategy is really, as a saying, to make use of supercomputing to then predict where should we make changes. Then we engineer these into tobacco, and you say, Tobacco. Why tobacco? Um, are these guys crazy? Almost, but the real reason is tobacco is, is very easy to transform, so we can change it genetically quickly. But it is a crop. Unlike things like Arabidopsis, it forms a dense canopy of leaves, as the soybean, canola, and so on. And so if this works in the controlled environment conditions, then we go out onto the farm with APHIS permits, and do this in replicated field trials. If they work there, then we go on to the harder crops. Now, of course, the Gates Foundation is concerned about crops for poor farmers in Africa and Southeast Asia, so the crops we're targeting are cowpea and rice. But this technology will work in many other crops, and so we've also been 
transferring the technologies to soybean and um, to maize as well, and probably wheat. Now, there are six of these pipelines we're pursuing. I'm just going to tell you about one of them to give you an example. And that is what we call the speed, speeding the rate of adjustment of efficiency to fluctuating light. And the, this concerns my laboratory. Um, and the problem is this. When a leaf is in full sunlight, it's actually receiving far more energy than it can use. But it absorbs that energy. The chlorophyll molecules become excited by that energy. If they can't get rid of it, they will then react with oxygen to form oxidizing radicals, which would literally bleach a leaf. So leaves of all crop plants, deal, or all plants rather, deal with this by inducing a process which converts that excess energy into heat. So they get rid of the excess energy as heat. The problem, though, is when that leaf goes into the shade, for example, of a passing cloud, now it could use all the light in photosynthesis, but it carries on dissipating a portion of that as heat for many minutes. And it takes some time before it's now using most of that for photosynthesis. So more than a decade ago, we were able to model this in a crop canopy, and we predicted that it could cost about 20% of productivity. So um, from a lot of information emerging from our rhodopsis and a colleague at Berkeley, we've, with the modeling, we eventually identified three genes that we should upregulate to speed this process up. This is a fluorescence imaging system we built at the University of Illinois, which allows us to actually, from fluorescence, pick up the speed of this relaxation. So we could do our transformations, then we could look at the seedlings and say, which of these are really showing the faster process we expected? Um, I won't go into the details, but we, we picked out three of these events, all of them strongly expressing the genes that we had added to, to this. But I would point out that these are not, in a sense, foreign genes. We're upregulating genes the plant already has. Now, of course, what we were really looking for, never mind all the biochemistry, was a more productive plant. And in 2014, with our first trials with this, so here is the wild type, here is the transformed plant, the pictures were taken at the same distance on the same day. They were sown on the same day. So it was pretty clear that we were getting more productivity. This was a preliminary field experiment, so we planned out a large one for 2015. And those of you who were trying to plant uh, in 2015 or had crops in the ground in May and June 2015 will be aware of the six inches of rain we had in 24 hours that completely flooded out our site. However, in 2016, in more favorable weather, um, a, a higher elevation site, we were able to do this, and we found that we got an increase in productivity of 20 to 14%, which in terms of crop increase in yield is, is huge. If conventional breeding now, if we can get 1 or 2%, that is amazing. Um, and we were lucky enough that science thought this was important, and they even featured it on their front cover. But I think it has broad, much broader importance than our work in that it does show that by manipulating photosynthesis, you can indeed get yield increases. And this opens the door for many other different approaches. Now we're moving on, um, as you heard, in conjunction with some companies to move this into other crops. Um, we're looking at soybean, canola, and maize. Um, and under the Gates Foundation, we can do that as long as it um, reflects their global access requirements, which means this technology is freely available to poor farmers in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Southeast Asia. Um, I just want to finish by talking about some of our work on plants for energy. I talked about food shortages. But I really think we, we do have an opportunity to do both of these things. 
especially in the United States, where we have such a huge land resource. And our strategy has been to focus on the most productive crops known. Uh, Sugarcane, obviously, which is great for the tropics. Um, sorghum, and this is a crop, we planted this on the farm late May. This is what it looked like in August. So these energy sorghums are incredibly productive. In the middle here is Miscanthus, and I point out that Illinois was the first place in the United States, right on the South Farms here, where this crop was trialed for the first time as an energy, energy crop. And that's led now to many companies taking this up as a bioenergy, and indeed farm operations in Missouri, Ohio, so on, taking it up as an energy crop. Um, I was involved very heavily in the Energy Biosciences Institute, which worked hard on deconstructing cellulose to fuels. And I realized just how hard this was. And one of the things it made me think of was, well, supposing we could take a crop like this, like sugarcane, sorghum, and so on, and get it to accumulate oil in the stem. Now, for example, if you take sugarcane, if all of the sugar in the stem was metabolized through to oil, then that would give you the yields of sugarcane in Florida, about 33 barrels per acre, if you could do that. Um, and our agricultural and biological engineering department took this information. And of course, the only miracle you need here is to get sugarcane to make oil in the stem. Everything else is in place. We know how to plant and process this crop. So the, the costs of doing that are very well known. And Vijay Singh said, well, if we could do that, that would provide you with biodiesel at a cost of just over $2 a gallon, which would be very competitive even at today's prices. So together with Brookhaven National Lab, we looked at how this might be done. And we set about putting that into sugarcane stems. And over the period of this project, we've managed to go from very low titer of oil in the, in the plant to now up to 8% in tissue. So we think it's really a, a question of just tweaking, continuing to tweak the transformation to get this up to 20%. Um, of course, oil requires extra energy, and we also looked at crops like sugarcane and maize, how we might be able to boost photosynthesis there. And the modeling picked out two pressure points, both of which have been created by rising carbon dioxide levels. They weren't pressure points at the concentration in which these plants evolved. And I won't go into the details of this, but basically what it shows is our transformants do indeed have the predictive physiology and higher rates. Our colleague, Freddie Outpeter at Gainesville, grew these out in the field and showed that seven out of, sorry, six out of seven of our events had significantly higher yields. So what could the US do with a crop like this if we can create it? What would it mean? Well, this area, the dark areas are where we grow our food crops. This area is where you can grow sugarcane in the United States. Um, maybe another spring like this, and we might be growing it in southern Illinois, but this is based on today's climate. So, um, and what we've picked out here are these yellow areas are areas which have recently dropped out of row agriculture. They may be in um, low intensity pasture, they may not be being used. But if you add all those areas together and you grew a crop like the one we're talking about on this, that would provide you with enough oil to replace two thirds of the country's diesel use. So if you then, for example, did this in sorghum, which can grow over a much larger geography, including uh, the Midwest, but also these areas, which are not in intensive agriculture, then you could achieve far more. So I'd say if we grasp the opportunity, we could meet future food demand, and the US could produce most of its liquid fuel demand renewably. 
Just mention two final projects that are funded by the Department of Energy. Um, with producing so much germplasm, phenotyping it becomes a major limitation. And this, together with um, engineering on campus, is a robot we've developed which carries a series of sensors to measure the plants as it goes up and down the rows. Um, and we're looking to market this as a low-cost platform for phenotyping a large amount of material. Um, a final project to which I'm um, the deputy director, Andrew Leakey is the director, is West, which is taking advantage of the fact that in a crop like sorghum, we could actually reduce its water use physiologically. And again, this is a result of rising carbon dioxide, which allows us to alter the plant so that it transpires less, but its photosynthesis is unaffected. Um, obviously, all this, this work is, all this work is the product of many graduate students, postdocs, faculty colleagues, at Illinois and elsewhere. So this is a very incomplete list of um, credits to finish with. I would say that Claire, Claire Benjamin at the back is our communications lead. And we have leaflets on each of these projects if you're interested in um, getting more information on these. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a great question, and that's something we're actively looking at because many of the changes we're making are really upregulation or downregulation of genes that are already present. And so genome editing, CRISPR-Cas9 in particular, will give us the opportunity to possibly knock out repressor elements to give the overexpression that we're looking at editing of promoters could give us the same effect. And I, that, that's something, you know, that we don't know how the authorities are going to treat that editing, but it is essentially like, you know, they are pretty well anything you can do with that type of gene editing is something you could achieve by mutation. It's just this is going to be much faster and much more directed. So, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, well, for, for most of our crops, the, the root system, the amount of mass that goes into the root system is, is not huge. Um, it, but certainly, um, Carl Bernacki, a faculty colleague, has been following till and no-till um, practices at Bonville over several years now. And one of the things that becomes apparent there is as the productivity of maize goes up, more and more carbon is indeed being sequestered. Um, so we've gone from a situation with, with the minimum no-till of steady state to actually accumulating carbon, whereas the till continues to release carbon from the soil. Uh, one of the things that it would be possible to manipulate, and I think again, um, a colleague at Penn State has been doing this over the years, modeling root systems, we know that we could, root systems actually have not been improved very much in plant breeding. And we know there are opportunities there where you could have deeper root systems 
for the same amount of investment. And as the roots go deeper, the carbon is more likely to stay there. So agriculture could definitely have an impact on this. We couldn't cancel out the amount of CO2 we're putting into the atmosphere, but we could certainly have a more positive impact. Steve, could you tell us a little bit more of working with NCSA? There's a lot of interest here in the combination of agriculture, computing, and technology, and how the two institutes are working together to achieve this outcome. Yes, I, I suppose, NC, well, NCSA have what they call a faculty fellows program, which means that anybody across the university can apply to them for, for example, a one-year support for using the supercomputer and either having a postdoc to work with them or staff in NCSA to work with them and so on on their project. And that's exactly what we did when we got this going of trying to simulate the photosynthetic process and then optimize it to predict the changes we should be making. We're now, um, the, we're now working with NCSA on a more ambitious project called Crops in Silico where instead of just trying to simulate photosynthesis, we're actually trying to simulate the growth, the growth of the crop, trying to put in basically as much knowledge as we can so that we can begin to tie in genomes with crop form in a forward approach. I, this is, much of what's done at present is a reverse approach. You, you find a plant which is different and then you try and see what gene might be different. This is really using our knowledge from the bottom up to try and build the organism. This has been done, for, there's a project in Michigan called the Virtual Rat, where they have done this with a rat, largely from a physiological perspective. So we're trying to do the same with a plant because we believe this will really revolutionize um, improvement of crops because as we did with photosynthesis, you can then work through thousands of possible permutations to predict your idiotype and what would make up that, that idiotype, for example. And you could do it for many different environments as well. So. Looking for other questions. I have one more, I guess, is if you could tell yeah. us more about working with the Gates Foundation. There are a lot of groups on campus that have aspired to work with such an esteemed foundation. What are some of their objectives that they're trying to solve with you and how has it been to work with them um, to achieve yeah. a grand goal? Well, of course, their, their primary objective is to make, to bring up the standard of living of particularly poor rural communities in sub-Saharan Africa, in the poorer countries of, of Southeast Asia. So it's always important to keep in mind that that's what they want to do and therefore, if you're offering them something, it's something that's got to have a realistic timeline, not, well, this is knowledge that, you know, we might better use in 100 years' time. Um, I'd say they, uh, in my long career, they've been by far the best granting agency to work with. Their program managers are very engaged with what we're doing, so their interest is highly visible, but they're not micromanaging what we do. They're very receptive when, when I kind of say, well, we thought this would work, but it isn't. We need to go this direction. They'll listen. And they won't take long to say, yes, you follow what you think is the best, best direction. So it's very different to, say, working with NSF, where they throw the grant over the fence. Three years later, you send them a report, and you get a, a one, one word grade back or something. <laughs> so. So. And then lastly, I had, we have our um, colleagues from Syngenta mm. here, and I know you have a relationship with them. Can you tell us a little bit more about entering a licensing agreement like that, of how you hope to use them as a commercial partner? Yes. I mean, it's primarily because, you know, one of the most important things to us was, um, actually, in our award, there's a stipulation that 50% of net royalties, I, if, if we invent something which is then used by a company, brings in an income, 50% of those royalties go back to the foundation. 
Now, as academics, it's hard for us to evaluate what of the things we what of the IP we're developing is seen by the industry of having value versus what isn't. So the agreement with Syngenta was that they could have, they would have a first look at the technology, they would advise us on what is really valuable, what perhaps isn't. They would obviously do an in-depth background IP analysis, which we couldn't do as well as, as they can. And finally, they would then um, provide support for the development of the, the patent and so on. Although, the, nevertheless, the IP would belong to the university. And it, it's a very similar arrangement to the one we had uh, in the EBI with industry as well, which, which worked very well. Thank you very much, Steve. And is there any questions? You don't think so? Then we'll get ready for the next panel. And uh, let's give a round of applause for Steve. Thank you.